Hi guys, so one of the questions that's come up for me a lot in this, in doing my research on IBD and dealing with what goes on on an ongoing basis with my daughter has been, why did my daughter get IBD? And I was, cause I was trying, I was thinking about it and I'm like, when I read certain studies, they say certain things. And so it's been less than a year since we got a diagnosis of IBD. My daughter was 18 months and her lactoferrin markers were high. And she's been sick off and off, off and on since she was eight months old. And I've contemplated a few things that went wrong with her from pregnancy because there were things going on even then and possibly even what she inherited from me, probably I'm sure that was part of it. Um, there was a study entitled Diet an inflammatory bowel disease published in gastroenterology and hepatology and they say that IBD has an unknown cause but multiple factors play a role in pathogenesis of IBD these may include diet environmental factors immuno immunologic factors infectious agents genetic susceptibility and the microbiome so if we're going to talk diet it's a good idea to talk about possibly likely nutritional deficiencies when I was pregnant. First of all, my husband and I used IVF to get pregnant. The drugs used were fairly minimal because we had a clinic that used low stimulation, meaning that they don't use a lot of drugs to get pregnant. That depletes your B vitamins, all of those estrogen and all of that stuff. I was depleted before pregnancy. I supplemented with B vitamins beforehand, some part of pregnancy, but I think that helped my sore, irritated tongue get better quickly once taking the supplement. I had lab tests done at each part of my pregnancy and to see what I was deficient in at the time. And so I'd have to look back, but I had different deficiencies at different times. So I was extremely nauseous at the beginning of pregnancy. I stopped all my supplements except the protein drinks till I was about six months pregnant. And at that time I got sick. I started taking my vitamin C again. I also took, um, I took about 12 of those every day, a thousand milligrams daily until the end of pregnancy because I read if you took more than 5,000 milligrams a day that you could have a baby born with rebound scurvy. Also that when you take it in, internally and in ingesting it in your digestive system that you would only get about half, your body would only assimilate half of what you took. So I probably was only getting about 6,000 milligrams. Anyway, it did help me get better. My lung collapsed when I was about six months pregnant and I needed a chest tube, a local anesthetic, morphine, and then albuterol breathing treatments for the rest of the pregnancy. I believe that medication could have contributed to increased candida before Jess was even born. I also had antibiotics two times during pregnancy and then one time right after my daughter was born due to urinary tract infection because of the catheter from having a C-section. There's an article that says that children an article, it's a research study, children exposed to antibiotics during pregnancy were at increased risk of IBD compared with general population control. Environmental factors that Jessica was exposed to include hair color. I was coloring my hair. I didn't do it that much, but I was thinking of the finances. There was a hair color that was more safe. It had less heavy metals. I did use the one that didn't wasn't ha didn't have ammonia, but I'm not sure that that mattered. I used it when she was f when I was four weeks pregnant, and then two more times during the pregnancy. So I also used regular deodorant and makeup. I didn't use the non-aluminum deodorant, which I'm using now while I'm breastfeeding, as well as the hair color that that is the one that's safer. When my lung collapsed, I needed a, a CAT scan, so I had to drink the liquid medium with the toxic chemicals, it's barium. And when she was 15 months old and I was still breastfeeding, uh, I needed a CAT scan of my liver due to the elevated elevated liver enzymes because we were, my whole family was exposed to mold when Jessica, before she was a year old. And then during pregnancy, I was sleeping on a bed with mold. I didn't know it. I don't know that it was affecting me that much because I wasn't having any symptoms. But after Jessica was born, she started reacting to the mold after she got sick with congestion and then we used a humidifier in her room to help her feel better and recover from the congestion. Um, I was told to test our home for mold and we had it and once the mattress was lifted, Jessica continued to have an extremely runny nose and was congested and had a very, very large rash on her back until we got out of our house. And I believe that, you know, that contributed to the yeast problem in her body. Jessica had a strange reaction to the vaccines where her ankles swelled. I think she was around six or seven months old. I don't remember exactly because I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it because it didn't last long. It might've been there for several days, might've been a week. It went away. So 
I didn't really think a whole lot of it. Immunologic factors. So we took her to an allergy and immunology doctor when she was between the ages of nine months and one year because we moved out after she was a, she turned one, she turned a year. So she might've been 10 months, I think. Doctor said that she was immune deficient and that we should not give her vaccines until that got resolved. She also showed that she had an IgE reaction to eggs on the lab test. It was only three different times and I gave her a good amount of eggs. She was projectile vomiting the next day and then had a fever of 101 for two days. So then um, the other things that she's been exposed to is infectious agents, which are RSV at eight months, Roseola at nine months, extremely congested about a month after that, which, where she needed an antibiotic. She got a very bad infection one month after turning two years old, where she had a runny nose that never went away. And then two weeks after that, she spiked a fever ranging from 100.4 to 100.3 for seven straight days. And that was the time when her gum started bleeding and the dentist told us that it was something systemic causing that. Genetic susceptibility, before Jessica was born, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia as well as dysbiosis, hypothyroid, adrenal exhaustion. My immune system had been extremely compromised. I had low NK cells, which is typical of chronic fatigue. I have multiple food sensitivities and anaphylactic-like reaction to eggs, just like my daughter. And then for Jessica's microbiome, she was born by C-section, had two rounds of antibiotics during pregnancy, and then one round a week after giving birth. And then my gut bacteria had been low off and on for many years before I even became pregnant. And I had SIBO symptoms before I was even pregnant. So, and I don't know that any doctor's ever gonna tell me that all of those things contributed to it unless they looked at her and, and like tracked this whole entire situation, which I, I, I've thought about putting together all of my lab tests and like, you know, different stages of her development. It would literally be like a, a huge research book or something because there's just so much there. And there, I'm sure there's way more research on all of those things than I've even been able to collect. I'm just, you know, just reporting on what's going on and, and what we're doing, what we're learning. So I hope this is helpful. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.